All right, guys, here we are for the second week of the Google Live Hangout Young Hustlers Mastermind Edition. We're going to be discussing uh, goal setting today. We're going to discuss what our Q2 goals are, the importance of goals, and then also we're going to touch a little bit on our morning routines and, and what we're doing to stay highly productive on a daily basis. So again here, AJ Mida, I'll be hosting today's uh, Mastermind. And we have Colton Lindsay and Brian Casella, just like last week. So let's start with you, Colton. Talk a little bit about your Q2 goals and um, give some tips about what you're doing, man, to make it happen. Yeah, I'll tell you the number one part of my Q2 goals is to get more of these bad boys. Oh, yeah. Checks in the mail, passive income checks. I love those. So uh, right now is a great time for my goals. I, I do a 90-day cycle. Every 90 days, I'm coming up with, okay, what's what do I want to achieve these next 90 days? Because we're in a lag business, right? So what I've got is for April, I want to hit 21 days prospected, 63 hours uh, on the phones, 735 contacts, set 40 appoint appointments, get on 15, take 10 listings, Um get six sold listings this next month, five buyer sales, five price reductions, five closed, uh, and at least make, and this will be a little bit of a push, but I think at least make 30 grand this month um, of April. For the month, for the quarter, I want to do $126,000 paid, which would equal 21 closed transactions. So I got to hit, my goal is 2,345 contacts and just over 200 hours prospected. So that's what I'm I'm shooting for. I want to take 30 listings too. Awesome. Next, Not bad. Day. Have you taken 30 listings in a quarter before? That's a, that's a pretty nice No. Day. No, that would be the first. So that would be sweet. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Cool. What about you, Brian? Um, basically... For me, the the next the next quarter is is very important. I've hit really good momentum in the first quarter, and I, I want to build on that. You know, I, I set really big goals this year. I wanted to do a million in commission, so I know for every quarter I got to make two hundred fifty grand. So, based on the goals that I've set, I would have to do at least twelve transactions in those three months. So, my goal for the next three months, since I've already started off really well, is to actually bump it up. I want to do fourteen or fifteen in the next three months instead of twelve. Um, you know, I notice whenever you set a goal, you always tend to get close to it, whether you miss it or you pass it. So my thought was always I'd rather create a, a goal that's really, really high. So even if I fall short of it, I'm still going to surpass what I had set before. So I have, I'm going to be working six days a week for the next 90 days, which I normally do anyway, but I'm really focusing it on this time. I set a minimum goal to prospect four hours a day. I want to be going on at least two listing appointments a week. And my goal for each month is to take five listings. Um, I've been on track to do that, and I've been doing really well. I got another listing this month, or I'm sorry, this last week. I have two more set to take already for next week. So I'm, I'm already kind of creating that momentum. And I think building on the goal is I think a lot of people either too quickly they get discouraged or, or they, they lose sight of the goal in the end. And this is something, because I get that question a lot about my goals, and it, it's not so much what your goal is, it's are you really focused on getting it? You know, I, I set these numbers, and these numbers I could tell to probably a lot of people in my office, or a lot of people I spend time with, and they'll say, you're crazy, you're not going to do it. But the funny thing is, when I set the goal, I always hit it, or I get very, very close to it. So, you know, I think it's really important that people really set these goals, and you look at them every day, and we're going to be talking about that later today, but, you know, when you set the goal, stick to it. Don't change it. You know, if something doesn't go right for a day or two, it doesn't matter. Keep on track. Keep doing what you said you were going to do. Stick to your goal and the factors that you can control. If you always hit the goal on the things you can control as far as, you know, hours prospected, the contacts you make, everything else is going to fall into place. And I think that's where people people lose uh, lose sight of that. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I totally uh, love what you said about, looking at your goal on a regular basis, you know, what, what, and I'm guilty of this too, but what a lot of people do is when they start goals is they set that goal for the year and then they don't look at it, you know, for another year, you know, first the following year, then they finally pull their goals back out and kind of look at, well, hey, I hit, I hit my goal or I didn't hit my goal, 
Um, it's it's really about looking at it every day, isn't it? What are you guys doing to make sure you're looking at it every day? You want me to post it? Post it everywhere. I have it in multiple places. Yeah. Funny story. I want to share. What did you say, Brian? When uh, like you guys saw me post the the video of my Audi on YouTube, I remember when I first got into real estate, that car was my my goal. I was like, man, I want this thing. I was obsessing about it. I was on YouTube. I had uh, pictures of it on my wall, and we all have vision boards. That's one way. That way, every time you wake up or you walk into your office or you leave, you're looking at it, and it's always in your sight. Another thing I did was when I was going door to door, I carried a, a picture of it with me. So if I set the goal to hit 50, 60 doors in that session, I would hit them. And sometimes, I won't even lie, halfway through, three-quarters of the way through or at the end, I'm like, man, I don't feel like doing it anymore. Yeah. But I always pull out that picture and say, I'm doing it for this. This is I want this so bad. And what's yeah. funny is a lot of the times when I would look at that picture, I would hit an extra 10 or 15 doors, and it was when I hit those extra 10 or 15 doors that I got that lead I needed or I got that appointment that I was going after. So, you know, I, I think you can get it's, creative. It's so often you know, that extra phone call that yeah. you make is the one that, that pays off. You get that appointment on the last call. Well, right. How many times is it not even the last call, but just by going out and putting the energy out there, like out of nowhere, someone just something yeah. just happens, right? Like right. that – I struggled with appointments this week, but I just kept going and going, and then I ended up getting two listing contracts from a phone call, and then also just right before we hopped on this hangout, I, I got a referral from a past client who will get listed on Monday. So, I mean, by Monday, I'll have three listings for the month. That's that's awesome. So, um, yeah, you just got to work, and then I think it naturally just falls into place a lot of times. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And um, and two, I just want to point out, people, we have a, a question box on the right side of the screen that you should be seeing. So if you have a question, go ahead and pop it in there. Um, my Q2 goals are um, to take a total of 18 listings, so I need to average six a month. And in order to do that, I need to go on about uh, 24 appointments. Uh, for Right now I'm averaging about 75% uh, of the listings I go on, I'll take. And uh, I want to sell 24 uh, in the second quarter. That would be 12 listings and, and 12 buyer sides. So that includes my two buyer agents. They'll, they'll be the ones selling uh, the buyers, and I'll be selling the listings. Uh, to do that, I need to be prospecting 10 hours a week or 40 hours a month for 480 contacts uh, to get on appointments a week. So, so that's really mine in a nutshell. And then I break that down uh, per month as well. So I got the quarterly goal, the yearly goal, and also the monthly, and then weekly, and then down to a daily goal. Yeah, and then if you're if you're somewhat like me, half the time you have to have an hourly goal. Like if I can get this done in the next hour, then that's that's a, that's a victory for me. It's a win. Right. So I, I love that. What, what do you guys? What do you guys do if you're behind on your yearly goal? So it's the second quarter. You know there might you know, might be some people that are behind on their their yearly goal now, not on track for it. So for me, me for example, I'm behind on a couple of listings sold. Um, so I, I need to catch up. What What are you guys doing to make sure you aren't in a in a deficiency the entire year for for your goals if you get a little bit behind? Um. Personally, I don't think it's a negative or a bad thing to be in a deficiency. However, what I would do in that situation is I would pick out – if you're doing 90-day cycles goals versus just always doing quarterly goals, you know, when we ended February and started March, the average agent is going to make um, you know, a goal just for, for that month, March, right? Whereas I think mm -hmm. that you make a new 90-day goal of March, April, May so that it's like that's my new 90-day cycle. And if I can get – you know, 21 or 30 or whatever listings it is the next 90 days, you can probably more than catch up with your goal. So if you do 90-day cycle goals, I think that that's what's, what's huge. Instead of just breaking them into quarters and months, mm -hmm. do 90-day cycles. Every month starts a new 90-day cycle. Okay, if I want 90 days paid this much, this is what i got to do right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And, and, and I think, too, for me, if, if I'm a little bit behind on, on any goal and any – what I'll do, rather than trying to catch up that next week or, or in this instant, trying to catch up everything in April for what I might be behind in the first quarter, I, I put that over the entire 90-day cycle. So if I'm behind three listings sold rather than trying to sell three more in April, I'll, I'll break that up. So one more in April, one more in May, one more in June. Um, so it's not too overwhelming. You know what I like to do? I did this for March. Is I, 
I like to pick a month where it's like I want this month to be the biggest month of my entire career, and then I just put all my energy into just blow it up. And then I had a huge March, right? I didn't hit my goal, but I still had the biggest, you know, fifty nine thousand paid in in March, and you know, one hundred and eleven paid in the quarter. And so if if you kind of put that focus, you can really have an explosion month. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. One thing that's helped me is. If I'm ever doing something and I'm behind, or for example, we're all doing real estate, if I'm one or two listings behind or whatever whatever it is, I'll, since we all track our numbers, I start looking, okay, where's my business coming from? And if I notice that there's a shortage in a certain area and an abundance in a certain area, like for example, let's say the for sale by owner market's drying up and I'm getting more expireds and I track my numbers and I'm doing really well with the expireds, I might start focusing a little bit more on that. And that's something that's helped me in the last six months is I noticed, okay, I'm tracking all my numbers. I'm getting more listings from this source, more buyers from this source. So I kind of, you have to also be willing to be a little bit flexible. You want to stay on your schedule and do what you said you're going to do, but you also have to be flexible enough to, if you see something's working that normally you wouldn't give so much attention to or so much effort to, and you pump it up a little bit more and you make a tweak, you might be able to extract more from that source. And that's one of the main things I've done that's really helped me is, I'm very perceptive about where I'm at and I'm tracking my numbers and if I see an increase suddenly in one of them, I'll put a little bit more energy in that one and I'll start getting a lot more business from that and I'll kind of be gauging the other ones as well. So that, that's a tip that, that I would give somebody out there, especially if they're behind. Take a look and analyze where you're getting your business from and make any necessary adjustments or tweaks for a certain amount of time and you'll you'll see a difference. Yeah. You know what? Goals are kind of like... I used to almost squeeze my goals so tight that like I, I got to do everything in my power to get this goal that it's almost like you squeeze it so tight you kill the goal, right? It's kind of you got to get them a little bit gentle and just like know that's your goal, but you got to be relaxed with it. it. I don't even know if that makes sense, but I think the more you just kind of can chill and feel good with it and, and believe it and just go to work, I think it just naturally just it just manifests. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with that too. And another thing with goals, it's, you know, make sure that it's your goal. You know, I, I feel, and I'm guilty of this before, is, is I set goals that necessarily weren't my goal. Um, and the mindset shift that I had this year is, is yeah, I want to make a lot of money, and my goal is to sell 75 homes this year, and that's going to produce enough. But it's also to work as little as possible. So at the end of the year, I, I don't care if I get that number one award in my office, whereas I might have before. My goal now is to sell that 75 homes and spend as much time on the lake this summer and snowboarding in the winter as possible. So, so you really got to find out what kind of lifestyle you want to create and what kind of business you want to have and, and set yourself up for success around that and, and don't let external forces so much influ influence your goals, if, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, no. So I was going to actually – there was a post in um – the fearless agent group and I loved your response that you said someone asked who is calling tomorrow on Good Friday and dude I didn't even know that Catholics were actually went to church to be honest with you I thought they were just religious in title but um, <laughs> but AJ said something was like call if you want to and don't call if you don't want to it's a ma it's not a matter of what people are thinking or what you should or shouldn't do it's a matter of what you want to do it's creating yeah. your, your business your lifestyle right yeah, that's the point. It, it's just to worry about on the receiving end. Think about it's what do you want to do and make it happen. You know, don't let those external forces be a limiting belief. You know. Yeah, I wish I could find that thread. I can't remember exactly what it said, but it was basically that in a nutshell. Yeah. That that, that was it. That I'm was it. I'm in Michigan since I came to Michigan on one Monday, so it's, it's all good. I'm just surprised they have internet in Michigan. I know. I'm hoping this isn't lagging too much. I'm in my my uh, my in-laws' office right now in a basement. In in North Carolina, we don't even really have basements. So your face so only far. your face only freezes like every 20 seconds. So it's not that big a deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yours is a little laggy. All right, I'm I'm just reading the questions here. To see if you know if I could. If I could touch on, on what you said, and I thought that was good, AJ, that you brought that up is, and I think I made a video about this on my YouTube probably a month ago. People don't realize how much their decisions are being influenced by other people because they never take the time to analyze it and say, is this me? 
And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are walking around pre-programmed with that without even realizing it. So anytime you set a goal or you're doing anything, you need to really look deep and say, is this coming from within and not being, it's not a chain attached to me from somebody else. That's yeah. one of the biggest contributing factors to improving my life overall, even outside of real estate, is just saying, hey, am I living my life or is someone else making decisions for me? Because uh, yeah. I can even think of to a month ago, I was still making decisions that were ingrained in me as a child from mom and dad or somebody else. Mm -hmm. and I didn't even realize advertising. I took a step back and said, hey, that's not me. But I, mm -hmm. And identifying what your goals are and what stage in life you are like, for example, I mean, Brian, your your major goal right now is uh, a GTR, right? Like that's what your focus is. You look at me, and my major focus is 400 feet of vinyl fencing in my backyard. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you just it's you just have to identify what what it is that you want, why it's important, and anchor that to. For me, it's I anchor it to the number of hours prospected. I have it right next to 15 hours prospected weekly, and I know that if I do that. I'm I'm gonna make 111 grand in, in 90 days. I just it just happens if you just go to work. So you have to be able to anchor the action item with with the result. And and I love how T. Harv Eker says this: your your roots determine your fruits, right? Your input determines your output. And almost we get so focused on what our our end target is. When really we should focus on what what it is we're planting, what what you know how we're nurturing. What grows, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. One thing that really got me to shift my mindset around it, like we're talking about making sure that's your goal, is I was listening to a podcast with Grant Cardone. Um, love, love his podcast and his stuff that he puts out. But he was talking about like, he's like, dude, if your goal is to be a millionaire. That's not your goal, you know. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a worthy goal to be a millionaire, and I want to be a millionaire. But it's like. You know what is that? You know it's one followed by six zeros. You don't even know what a million dollars is. So his point is, is you got to look at what is what do you want your lifestyle to look like, and then you got to reverse engineer how much is your lifestyle going to cost. And, and there's actually a great exercise in the Four Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss that talks about that. Um, it's like a dream worksheet or something, but but it has a breakdown. What kind of house do you want? Well, what's the mortgage payment going to be? What kind of car do you want? Well, what's the payment going to be on that? How many vacations do you want to take? What's going to cost? So then you figure out, well, hey, it's going to take me twenty thousand dollars a month to live the lifestyle I want to live. And then you can, and then you can figure out, well, hey, I need to make three hundred thousand dollars a year to afford that lifestyle. So I thought that was pretty cool. Well, you know what? As you as you start having these months where you're having thirty, forty thousand dollars in income, your thermostat just is boom. Like if I do twenty grand in a month, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so poor, right? And um, yeah. so it's it's cool how it's cool to think about the progression of how your thermostat is is rising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your financial thermostat. How how often are you guys? Uh, I mean, just really just sitting down and examining your goals. All the time, every day. You know, it's it's one of those continuing processes. And I think the more you work at it, the more you tweak it, the more you add to it. The, more involved you get in it, and by virtue of you getting more involved in it, the more you're going to go after it. And I think, like we said earlier, most people will set that goal, file it away in their desk, and not look at it until December and say, hey, well, I was short this year. You know, I think, yeah. people, like we were saying, what you focus on expands, and people aren't, aren't obsessed with it. And I think that's something that Grant Cardone talks about is society, if you're labeled as obsessed, it's, it's considered a bad thing. Absolutely not. I'm entirely obsessed with my goals. That's why I wake up every day with a smile on my face and get to work and knock on 100 doors, 150 doors a day or go after the fizzbos and the expires because, like Colton said, it's anchored to what I want and I've become obsessed with it. So when you want something bad enough, the human being is an incredible creature, you'll get it. So, And, and I think people don't honestly believe that and that's the problem. So That's what, um, what you're talking about. I, I'm, I'm writing a book, Winning the Inner Game of Real Estate Sales and have you guys read Psycho Cybernetics? I know AJ has. Have you read that, Brian? Not yet. Okay, so in there, he talks about how your mind is just this automatic machine of just goal handling. Like you put it in, and your your mind will just achieve that goal, right? But you got to put it in there, and so that's the concept of my book on how to do that as far as related to real estate sales, but. Okay, so if the goal is, let's say, a half a million dollars in income, and I know, for example, I just told you my goal in 
uh, April is 63 hours prospected, 21 days on the phones, 735 contacts. That breaks down to 35 contacts a day. That's pretty simple math, but what's the, the next step that a lot of people I think are missing is, okay, when am I going to get those 35 contacts and how am I going to get them, right? I, I can tell you, Monday morning, Brian, what's your, goal, your contact goals for Monday? 50. 50 contacts. What time are you starting at? Uh, 7.45. 7.45, and where are you going at 7.45 to start those contacts? First expired. And are you knocking doors or calling those? Knocking. So you already know you've got it time blocked in there. You know, okay, the very first most important frog I'm going to eat on Monday morning is this expired door, and I know exactly where I'm going to hit to get it, right? So you've got to be able to I, – I've learned from my mentor, Bob Leffler, with Fearless Agent, that you each week – Usually on Fridays after I'm done with these mastermind calls, I take two hours and do what I call a smart week where I literally evaluate the goals I've, I set for the week and I see, okay, what's my goals for the next seven days and when is it on my schedule to take the action to accomplish these goals? I know that there's one thing that really, really drives me to get deals closed and that's going on listing appointments. So I need to really focus on how many appointments am I setting going on. So you got to put that in your schedule when you're going to, to, to take action on these. Right, and when it is in your schedule, it becomes less of a choice. You know, if, if commitment to that goal, it's it's kind of you wake up and it's like, hey, yeah, I'm going to do this today or I'm not going to do it. Whereas you can tell through Brian's passion and the way he's describing what he's going to do, he, he it's just going to happen. It's, it's not even a choice anymore. It's, it's already done. It's in his schedule. That's his job. He just goes to work. I love it. Well, and he knows his numbers. I can't tell you how many times agents will call me asking if how much I charge for coaching or what coaching program I recommend. And I'll, the first question I ask them is, well, how many transactions did you do the previous year and or even year to date? And they can't answer that question. They don't even know how many deals they closed. To me, it's like I know exactly how much I've been paid. I know how many deals I've been closed. I know how much is pending that's going to pay me in the next 30 days, right? Like – it, it, it's right there at the tip of my my tongue always, and I think you've really just got you become what you think about most of the time, and if you constantly think about okay I need to hit 50 contacts Monday morning, that's what you will become, right? Because th those roots are what determine the GTR. It's it's not thinking about the GTR that brings it to fruition. I mean that helps because it smells good, it feels good, but. Thinking about the, the, the doors you're knocking, what you're doing to produce that is what will grow the GTR. Mm -hmm. Right. Love it. Cool. You guys want to jump in and – well, here, let me let me ask her, uh, get into a couple questions real quick. Um, so we have a question here kind of tying to goal setting um, about kind of what your guys' average uh, transaction is right now. So the question is, do you guys have a minimum sales sales price for a listing you'll take? Uh, for me, personally, I don't have a minimum. AJ, would you read your name? But I have a minimum that I'll charge. We got some loud echo going on. Yeah, I can hear that. AJ, we you now? Brian, do you totally hear totally doing it? You sucker. sucker. What do you mean? There's like an There's echo. Like an echo. <laughs> so every time, <laughs> so every I, time talk, I talk, it comes it back comes into back your into microphone, your microphone and, speaks. and speaks. You got to turn your volume down. Hey, AJ. That's just that question. All right. If you have headphones by you, Brian, that might help. Throw those in. Um, so the question, um, so is, the question basically, is, do you guys have a minimum, have a minimum sales, sales price for price listing that you take? Um, and I'll answer that question for me. I don't have a minimum, but I have a minimum that I'll charge. I'll charge. So, so if I take a hundred thousand dollars, the minimum commission that I would charge is four grand. So I'm not going to do a commission unless I'm making at least four grand. So you got to make at least four grand. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I don't necessarily yeah, I don't have a minimum have commission. I just kind of track what my average commission is and, and try to raise that. So, for example, one thing that I've done 
working with uh, with my coaches is okay if I am going on a smaller listing I'll go and do that but I'm just going to charge a higher commission right so if it's under 150 grand I definitely have got to get at least a seven percent um, commission or I, I'm just not even going to deal with it and it's so much easier to know that f dude 2500 bucks yeah I can't do it for I can't do it for less than seven percent on this I'm sorry it's and when you have that attitude that's like you don't want it people are more like oh, okay yeah let's let's do this All right. Who who re who asked that question? I missed that through all the echoing. That was Matheson and Associates. Okay. Cool. What's your uh, and, a good question I would have is what is your guys' average sales price and commission? And I I'm trying to unmute you, Brian. I muted you during all the echoing, and it's not allowing me to unmute you right now. So I Sucker. that out. So my average sale price last year was 172, and this year it should be 225. All right, Brian, you should be unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, my average sales price right now is just under 500. So my average commission check Ooh, is baby, about 14, 14 and change. <laughs> you freaking homo! I'm moving back to Cali. Seriously, dude. <laughs> my my average commission is 5,800 bucks right now. Which is huge, dude. I in 2012, my average commission was like 3,800 bucks. So I've pushed it up two grand a deal. That's a nice pay raise. Yeah, I like that. I uh, all right. I'm, can you can you guys see that that question on the screen right now, or is that just me looking at that? I think just you, dude. Just you. Okay, cool. So this is um, Wilson asks uh, Brian. So is your door knocking daily – what does your daily schedule look like for door knocking? So that will kind of um, take us into the next topic, which is going to be a, a little bit of scheduling, but more focused on the morning routine. But you can go ahead and, and answer that. Brian, what does your daily door knocking slash daily routine look like? Okay. Uh, that's a really good question. Honestly, it's very simple. I try to – now, this is the thing. Expires and for sale by owners is what I will always start and end my day with. So – if there is an expired or for sale by owner that's new in my market, in my core area, I'm hitting them. Between 7.30 and 7.45, I'm hitting the first one. Now, a lot of people will say it's too early. I don't agree with that. You know, if they're motivated and they need my help, I want to be the first one to talk to them. So, in a perfect day, I will, from about 7.30, 7.45 until 8, uh, 11.30, 12, I'm hitting, I'm starting with my expired and for sale by owners, and then I already have pre-planned from the night before an area I'm going to hit, whether it's around an old expired, old for sale by owner, or this section in a market that I know is hot that I picked out the night before, I'm just going to hit doors. I'm going to hit minimum 80, 90 doors just right there and you know, do my little hot market script or whatever script I'm going to use. After that, you know, I have my admin time and all that. I block out appointments usually between 3 and 5, and after that, if I didn't get a hold of those for sale by owners and expires from the morning, guess what? I'm going back again at night. I'm going and knocking on their door again between 6 and 7. Now, if it's summer and the sun goes down at 8.30, I'll hit them even later. I'll hit them at 7.30 sometimes or 8. And it's pretty much that attitude, whatever it takes to have a conversation with them. So to break it down simply, it's start and end with expires and for sale by owners and all the random contacts in between there. And, and to follow that up, he also asked, Brian, how many doors and contacts do you average, average an hour? I think when I average it out, I'm getting about 10, 10 or 11 contacts an hour from the doors. But keep in mind, I'm hustling. I'm not you know, talking to people for too long. I'm keeping it very short and concise. I either get a lead, an appointment, I capture their information if I can, and I'm walking to the next door quickly. There's no wasted effort. There's no playing around on my phone a lot. I mean, it's just very focused and, you know, purposeful. You know, I'm out there to get business. I'm not out there to lollygag and mess around. So when I tell people I can hit 100 doors in two or two and a half hours, they're like, how? And I say, well, walk faster. Well, and part of the advantage Run is you're like, you're like six foot eight, right? So you walk bigger strides than most people. <laughs> yeah, 6'10", close. Are you really 6'10"? Plus, no, dude, I'm 6'2". Oh, like, oh sh <laughs> you look like 6'10 <laughs> in videos. I never met you in person, so I don't know. He, he can dunk, though. I've I seen it. Oh, snap. Easy. 
I used to be able to in high school. Not no more. <laughs> I'm, I'm only six one though, so you got an inch on me. Sweet. That's cool. Yeah, and and Brian's committed. I mean, he's out there in a shirt and tie with dress shoes on. I mean, uh, running shoes on. So he's not even messing around with the dress shoes. He's got some colorful running shoes on because I mean, he's hustling from door to door. He's making it happen. So, so let's transition into our next topic, which is going to be what we're doing in the morning. Um, so, Brian, go ahead and, and kind of launch that. So what, what does your morning kind of look like? Um, talk about affirmations a little bit. Okay. Uh, morning routine for me is very simple. Uh, I'll kind of touch on that before I get into the affirmations. But I'm up every day between 5 and 5.15 usually, regardless of the time that I go to sleep. And that's a point I wanted to bring up. I can go out and have fun at night and be out till 1 or 2 in the morning. I'm still going to get up at 5 because I have a job to do. And I think that's, that's a missing link for a lot of people. Once you, once you commit to this process, you have to be in no matter what. So I wake up early. There's two things that happen at that time. Usually three days out of the five work days, Monday through Friday, I'll go straight to the gym. And I'll work out for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. If not, I'm uh, sitting at my kitchen table here journaling and reading. I block out at least 30 minutes or an hour every morning to uh, to read and just fill my mind with something positive or, you know, every once in a while I'll go on YouTube and, and watch a lecture or something motivational. So I block that time out early in the morning for that and I just fill my mind with good stuff. From then, from about 6.30 to 7 is when I'm just preparing everything for the day that I haven't prepared the night before, anything that's left over. Every once in a while I will actually follow up with leads. You know, if there are people that are busy during the day, I ask them, if I was to call you at 6.37 in the morning, would that be okay? And, yeah, I've set many appointments at 6.37 in the morning, and that's that's a little tip I'm giving. I never really told anybody that, but it's I do it, and I'm honest about that. So, and that really time... Gets the worm. Right, right, and after that... Wait, you set, or you're knocking doors at that early? No, I'm just following up. I won't knock doors oh. that early. Oh, uh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so pretty much from 7 to 7.30, it's just get ready, uh, you know, get dressed, shower up, shave, everything. 7.30 to 8 or 7.45, I'm usually role-playing with my headset on, but I'm probably on the road already, so I'm always doing that on the go. And then 7.45, 7.50, like I said, I'm hitting that first that first expired or for sale by owner. So, you know, that, that, that morning block, I think, is really important, and people overlook that, and you know, the, the minute that alarm clock goes off or whatever it is it used to get up, it's your mind just has to be like, okay, it's, it's, it's work time. Let's go. And once you start doing that regularly, after about seven to ten days, it'll become a habit and it'll become easy. But, you know, the, the main thing I would suggest people focus on is create a ritual, follow it, and then at some point in that, in that morning, fill, fill your mind up with something from a book or something positive because that, that's what's going to create that momentum that gets you going through the whole day. And you know, it just it just makes everything else flow. You know, once my morning is is spot on, everything else just just goes really well. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, you got to keep feeding your brain with good positive stuff. I mean, if you're not doing that on a consistent basis, there's a way you're going to wake up every day at 5:30 and then hustle all day long uh, for long term. You're just going to burn out. Right. Colton, man, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, man, usually I just roll out of bed about 7.30 and kick my shoes on and go to work. I mean, that's, that's just how, no. I, uh, I'm out of bed between 4.30 and 5. And, um, you know, just depending on, on how I feel, sometimes I'll read a book. Sometimes I'll put on some yoga on Hulu, right? They got free yoga videos, and I'm not great at it, but it feels okay. good to stretch. Really, the whole <laughs> thing I try and do in the morning is just get some silence in my life and be disconnected from my phone and from everything else and just kind of, I, I guess, what's what's a good word, just kind of meditate on, on what's going on in my, my existence. So that's usually what I do. I Sometimes I'll get to the office about 6.30 to 6.45 um, and then I usually try to either shoot a YouTube video or read more in, in a book and then by 7.15 we're really starting with my sales team coming up with our goals for the day and by 7.30 to 8 we're, we're role playing and then eight o'clock I'm on the phones um, so that's kind of the routine what I have done in my my what I call my silence time I call it daily silence I've, I've done things like I, I broke down my spiritual mental physical social and financial realm I wrote all the affirmations in those categories with my life and I recorded them 
in my voice with Baroque classical music in the background, and I'll just listen to that um, either in the mornings or when I'm driving somewhere. So I'm always hearing myself saying, I love my life. Uh, money comes easily frequently. It's normal to earn $500,000 a year. I cash checks frequently. I love my wife. I love my dog. Whatever it is in each thing, you know, you can tell I've ingrained these in because you become what you think about, and that's what I want in my life. So that's a huge tip for, for if you guys aren't doing that. Record the thing that you want in your voice with Baroque music, <clears throat> classic musical in the in the background, and just hear yourself telling yourself that you are awesome, you are great, whatever it is that, you know what I'm saying? Right. Whatever the mm. affirmation is. Yeah, it, it sounds a little fruity, but it definitely works. I, I personally don't do it, but um, it's something I want to implement. And I've heard, you know, people like Jack Canfield, you know, Tony Robbins recommending that. So um, it, it works if you guys are out there thinking it's fruity. It, it's well, and, and it's the productive and it works. The Baroque classical music is great to even put on low level when you're reading a book. It changes your brain waves. I mean, this is scientifically yeah. proven that it, you'll absorb what you're trying to program into your subconscious mind at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I took that tip with the Baroque music from you last last year on another mastermind we had. And so I like to go to Starbucks and get some work done. Um, I like to work on my goals there a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I I'm, um, I think I'm a lot more creative there, and I I I just I'm in a good state when I'm at Starbucks. So I'll, rather than listening to the people there, I put in the Baroque music or um, just some piano music because music with words distracts from your thinking. So, oh, so yeah. I love that tip. Yeah. Well, and think about cool. it too. I don't know what you I I know what Brian listens to. It's not he's not listening to the radio when he's out and about knocking doors, right? You're listening to something positive in the sense of think and grow rich, how to win friend whatever audio book or Grant Cordon stuff, right? Something that's programming your your mind to be a hustler. Right. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah, I mean that, and that can actually be a, a a challenge for you as well because like if you if you program yourself to hustle all the time, sometimes you never slow down to just mm -hmm. smell the roses, right? Yeah. Exactly. I, I got to the point where every time I drive, I'm listening to like Jim Rohn or Zig Ziglar or Tony Robbins or different yeah. podcasts on business. And like, it got to the point where that's all I was listening to. And it's like, dude, man, I, I got to relax a little bit and just listen to some music and jam out while I'm driving a little bit. Because cause you do get in that state of mind because you do enjoy listening to that stuff. And it's it's awesome for you. Yeah. But it's like relax and, and jam out sometimes too. Put, put some, gonna... uh, some good stuff on. I'm not going to lie. I've been known to clear my schedule a time or two and hit the, the matinee movie theater by myself, too. That's always... <laughs> by yourself. <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm, it's it's funner to go by myself. I don't have to worry about my daughter crying. I'll uh, I'll touch on what I do briefly in the morning. It's very guys, and we'll get into some questions that we got here um, in the feed. So if you haven't posted any yet, go ahead and post some questions. But um, my ideal morning routine, and I say ideal because it doesn't always happen. You know, I'm not a robot, but um, I have a great workout group. Uh, it's called F3. Um, it stands for Faith, Fellowship, and Fitness. We work out together at 5 in the morning. Uh, typically, there's anywhere from 15 to 20 guys, and there's uh, different workouts all over Charlotte that does that. So I'll start off that, um, and that workout ends with prayer. So it's, it's a really neat uh, um, work, guys, that, that speeds me both uh, physically and spiritually. Um, I'll, I'll typically walk my dogs. I have two Siberian Huskies, so they got to get walked in the morning, so that will follow my workout. And then I, I do, I'll do some si uh, silence and prayer. Uh, for silence, for me, it was always kind of like um, if I'm just going to sit there in silence for 10, 15 minutes in the morning, I'm probably going to fall asleep. So I found this really cool app. It's called Headspace, and um, this is just a, the creator of the app um, just taking you through um, some silence exercises and, and that's been really neat. I've, I've been loving that. And then I'll follow that up with some uh, visualization of my um, kind of my end of year goals. Like I'm, I'm planning a trip to Thailand, so I'm envisioning myself in Thailand and what that's going to feel like. Um, and that's been that's been pretty fun. It's kind of like a mini trip there. And then uh, also visualizing my bigger goals like um, the house on the lake, you know, the nice cars, um, things like that that I want. So putting myself there in the, in the present um, through visualization has been pretty powerful. So and then uh, some affirmations as well. In in the book, uh, The Power of Positive Thinking, Dr. Norman Vincent Pill wrote it. He talks about prayerization, 
uh, visualization and actualization. And to me, prayer is one of the be best and easiest ways to connect through source energy, the, the, the well-being, the harmonic flow, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. to just really get centered in, inside. And I think that's obviously important. One thing you said that you were visioning uh, Thailand, right, AJ? You're going there would be like you're probably checking out some videos, YouTube pictures, whatever. Here's what I've learned is the absolute best way to role play is visualize doing the listing presentation. Literally visualize. I mean, if if everything makes sense and you're comfortable, would there be any stopping you from getting the ball rolling tonight? I, I asked that question in my presentation. I just imagine them saying, "Yeah, we'll we'll be getting it going." Or again, I when I asked mm -hmm. the question in a nutshell, this is my philosophy to get top dollars. This is definitely what you're looking for. I envision them saying yes, and me saying giving them the pen and them just naturally signing the contract. And since I started doing that way more than role playing, I get way more contracts signed with fewer objections than when I was role playing trying to handle objections. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Have you ever? Sorry to change topic, but I remember I used to role play with Derek Lipsky a lot, and I feel like we would get really into these hard objection handling type battles. And I realized that's more of what I ended up doing on my live prospecting calls versus just having easy role plays. Now when I prospect, I have easier, easier prospecting calls or easy, easier presentations. So take that visualization and visualize, you know, getting the contracts and getting the appointment set. That's a great mm -hmm. thing you're doing. Silence. Mhm. Mm yeah, I, I love that. I'll on the way to an appointment, I'll turn the radio off or or my podcast off like five ten minutes before I get there, and you can go through those visualization exercises. Um, it's been a powerful thing, so I, I totally agree. It works. Cool. Anything you guys want to add before we hop into just answering uh, some of these questions that we got here? Um, I think just the biggest thing that is, is part of your morning routine and part of your goal setting is just include a lot of gratitude, and whether it's through silence or prayer, however you do it, I mean, I, I think literally vocalize it prayer and to a higher being, whether you believe in God or not, I think that that is probably one of the most powerful things you can do in your life and your business is to express that gratitude. I mean, we really are fortunate to not only be in real estate, to not have this technology to talk to, you know, I mean, there's, we are just really blessed individuals and I th the more you can give gratitude for that, the more you'll just receive an abundance in your life. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been. Um, I'm rereading Success Principles by Jack Canfield. Let me show you guys. So I'm rereading that right now, and the chapter I'm on is talking about um, setting your goals, and it talks about kind of like setting your goals, how it's an internal GPS for you. And um, I'm just going to read this this one thing I've highlighted real quick, but it says all you have to do is decide where you want to go by clarifying your vision. Lock in the destination through goal setting, affirmations, and visualization, and start moving in the right direction. And then it goes on to talk about once you do those things, your inner GPS is set. And if you get a little off track at a subconscious level, you'll, your internal GPS will put you back on course to get to your goals. Um, and, that, and that's really what the affirmations and visualization stuff t does for you. A lot of people think it's kind of weird, like what's an affirmation going to do? But what it's doing is it's changing you at a subconscious level, and um, it's, it's helping you get to your goals, and you're not even consciously thinking about it. So, so, so it's pretty powerful when you look at it from that aspect. Anything you want to add, Brian, before we hop in these questions? Uh, yeah, you know, I have some affirmations that, that I use, but I think one of the missing elements is people need to really, when they say it, believe it. I think a lot of people, a lot of the times, are just in the routine, and they just say it. But unless everything's aligned and you really emotionally feel like you can actually do what you're saying, it's not going to work. You're just going to be going through the routine. And I think that happens mm -hmm. in prospecting and anything else, too. People are just going through the motions instead of really being in the moment and really being in oh, there. Oh, yeah. And, I, and th th that's a big key, I think. And another thing that I changed as well that would be a tip for people is when I was desiring something, I, I stopped saying I want this or I need this. I started yeah. saying I deserve this. And there, mm -hmm. there's, you know, the power of language and words. People don't realize how powerful that is. So just changing one word like that 
can, can completely have a different effect. And I've done that recently, and just those little tweaks make such a big difference. Yep, and, and it's the same thing with, rather than saying, I will be a successful agent, it's I am a successful yeah. agent. Because yep, if you I, say I will, your subconscious mind's always telling you, you will be, you will be. It's never present, so you got to say, I am. Right. So that's another great thing to start your affirmations with is, I am this, I am this. I think I am are the two most powerful words in the English language. I am and I can. That's what God said. Am. Yeah, that's what God said. Amen, brother. Easter, man. <laughs> So uh, I, I think that feeling, feeling that it's real, is important. That goes to your believability index, and you got to believe at a level ten, and 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 pretty much believe the impossible is possible. And that sounds kind of goofy to do, but it's on like the radar screen of the the control tower. They can't see the planes off radar, and that's a lot how our life is. Those opportunities, those gifts in our life, we can't see them. But you have to know, you have to believe that they're going to naturally show up. you got to get off your ass and go get them, but they're there. I love it. Cool. So let's dive into these questions real quick. Um, so we have a question. Charlie says, uh, seems like you guys are just focused on for sale by owners, expired, Thornock, and SOI. Are you doing anything other than that to generate seller slash buyer leads? So, so I'll answer that first. Uh, Charlie, um, I currently have a buyer site set up uh, through Real Estate Webmasters, and I do some pay per click advertising for my, my buyer team, and we're um, getting about 100 leads a month through that for the buyer side of the business, and, um, and then just working with clients. Um, so that'd be an additional thing to that. Um, but yeah, it's it's all built on the prospect inside of the business for the most part. So yeah, guys, I would say the same thing. I have I use pro agent websites, and I mean between Facebook ads and remarketing ads, I maybe two hundred fifty bucks a month. We get about sixty five leads a month from there. That we don't even all we do is we just put them into our mojo and we just dial them. I mean it's all about calling people and contacting them, and really. I would say probably Fizbo's is maybe going to be only 10% of my business this year. It, it just kind of appears. I did build my whole business off of that, but I've now been able to create between referrals and people farm and just other methods that I don't have to rely on them as much, especially in this type of market. Yeah, I'm just now exploring yeah. other things, you know, mailing and reaching out to other avenues, but thus far I've built my business on prospecting, and I think everybody should do that, so... You know, there, there's definitely a lot of things that work, but if you're not prospecting base, uh, I think you're you're building yourself on the wrong foundation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these people that get into the business immediately to, to and get up these website leads to generate leads, I think, is so silly. I mean, you just you, you can start more, I guess, return on investment type activities by just getting on the phone and talking with people like Brian does is go knocking them and then get some money earned up and you start to expand your business plan but don't start you know just trying to spend tons of money on marketing we're in the sales business not the marketing business right. yeah especially when you're new in the business I know we have a few people that are new watching it's like at the beginning I mean you gotta hustle you can't just hope you're gonna pay Zillow a thousand bucks a month or something and get business <laughs> you gotta be on the phones and, and you wanna generate listing leads because listings are leverage. And I think paying Zillow any money is the most ridiculous thing you could do on planet Earth if you're a real estate agent. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> think about this. I get calls from Zillow probably once a month. Oh man, we've got a special opening in your zip code. Hop on it now, whatever. They make money by doing what I'm supposed to be doing and that's calling people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They're, they're prospecting. They're not... Um doing PPC to find real estate agents. Yeah, the only reason, and just a disclaimer, the only reason I have a buyer pay per click campaign set up is because I have two buyer agents that I gotta keep fed. I don't mess with that at all. That's not a good use of my time, but but we do see a ROI on having those two buyer agents. So it works out good. But you didn't you didn't put that day one in your business, right? No, I was in the business for two years before I did that. Early on, I did waste money. I, I spent some money with Realtor.com. My first six months in business, I wasted like five hundred dollars right off the bat. Um, got like one lead. So remember when you first got money. in and you ordered five thousand keychains with your name on it? <laughs> I never did that. <laughs> Although I do have agents in my in my office asking me if they should do stuff like that. 
<laughs> and I say no. And you're like, yeah, how many do you want to buy from me? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a waste of money. Um, Henry asks, uh, hey, guys, uh, thanks for the hangout. Question for the group, what percent did you guys double end this last quarter? Um, I only double end about probably 10% of listings sold, not, not a huge percentage. Yeah. I think that's what he's asking. What, what about you guys? Both sides. I maybe do one or two deals a year is all where I'm both sides. Very few. In fact, I don't even try to. I I just it makes the deal more complicated in my opinion. Yeah. What about you, Brian? It's rare. Rare for me too. I think last year I might have double ended one, maybe two. Same thing. It's very, very few. Yeah. I think I think the way real estate is changing too, I think you'll see fewer and fewer of those. Um, um, double ending transactions. Yeah, the only time you see people double ending transactions like at a high level, it's it's one of these large teams, say with like twenty agents, and I mean, they're basically a brokerage within a brokerage, and I, I, to me that's not really double ending a deal. So when you hear people say they're double ending like thirty percent of their deals, well, that's yeah, the buyer agent, they're the listing agent, yeah. and they have ten buyer agents. So that's like saying every. You know, listing at my office that brings a Keller Williams agent sells it. That's a double end, which is not. Um, hey, hey guys, what's your advice for new agents? This is from Hector Merez, I think it's pronounced. So, what's your advice for new agents, and how do you get organized, or do you just start? Or how to get organized, or just where, and how to start? So I guess Colton, what's your advice to new agents? My advice to new agents is start prospecting and go join up, join the fearless agent movement, man. Um, for ninety-seven dollars a month, you can learn the foundations of real estate versus having to figure it out. Guess. Don't try to get. Find a, a model that you know works. Someone that's doing it and duplicate it. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my first year in the business, um, I mean, I got Rookie of the Year for my office, but I didn't do that much business, so the, the, the Rookie of the Year was in a very prestigious award, in my opinion, at that time, in my office. Um, and the reason for that is because I spent so much time trying to figure out what to do, where to start. But like Colton was saying, you just got to pick someone, model their success, and any three of us would be a good start, I would say. Um, check our YouTube channels, Google us, and, and you'll find some content that we're putting out there on how to be successful in this business. I mean, Brian and I are both less than or just over two years in the business. I think Brian, two years this July, me just past my two-year anniversary, and we're both already selling. Last year, we both sold over like 34, 35 homes. So... What do you think, Brian? Can you repeat the question one more time? I got a little lost. Yeah, just new advice to new agents. We were just saying you should start with prospecting and watching our YouTube channels. Yeah, work. Get to work. You know, <laughs> four-letter word everybody hates. Um, I got. I got. I remember. Hey, I your audio is is going out of control, dude. Again, really? It's all staticky. We're gonna put you in the corner, bro. Mute you if you keep <laughs> pulling this shenanigan. Is it is it clear now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I remember when I first started, I didn't have anything really down. I was still was studying the scripts and everything, but I just got out there. I started making calls, started knocking on doors. Within I think a week and a half, I got my first listing. Three days later, I got another listing, just because I didn't know any better. I was just out there talking to 50, 60, 70, sometimes 80 people in a day, looking for business. And when you're really out there and you're hungry, people appreciate that. I still hear it almost every day now. They're like, wow, you're out here knocking on doors. Like, you know, if I want, if I had an agent, I would want somebody like you working hard. That's what people want. And I think yeah. people associate, you know, sales as something bad, but it's not. You know, think, put yourself in the seller's shoes. Wouldn't you want somebody like Colton, you know, who's on the phone four hours a day working for you or someone like me who's door knocking, trying to sell their listings and getting more business. You want somebody that's active. So, we're for the people or the sellers that really need to get a home sold, and they need these kind of agents, which are the ones that work. So that's that's really the only advice I can give you. Absorb as much information as you can to learn the business and just work. Talk to people because that's the only way you're going to get better. You can role play, practice, visualize, but if you're not actually putting in the work, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. When 
think about this. How how long were you in the business, Brian, before you got into a coaching program? I uh, I got in coaching before I got my license. AJ, how about you? Yeah, it was a matter of months. So uh, there, to me, five percent of my income goes into what's called an education fund. And I see a lot of agents ask me about, you know, signing up for Mojo or Vulcan or this or that, and they're not willing to pay any money for coaching. Yeah. Doing it backwards. Don't start for all these systems. Get into a coaching program that's going to step by step show you what to do to succeed. And there's a very affordable coaching program. I know James Hotelling used to have the Real Skills class for like hundred some bucks a month. I used to teach that a long time ago. You know, Fearless Agent has theirs for ninety-seven dollars a month. I'm sure there's other programs, but get into a coaching program before you go sign up for 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 Vulcan Seven, which is two hundred fifty bucks a month. Who cares if you have all these leads and you don't even have the skills to convert them or the know-how to service them? You need to to get the education side. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, you have to invest back in yourself. Um, I mean, that's got to be number one, no doubt. Uh, another question we have uh, comes from, uh, I think it's Jeff Johnson. He says, um, do, do you know of anyone who has been running another business and successfully transitioned into full-time real estate sales? Um, and then what were some elements and methods used to do it? Uh, so, so Jeff, I was actually running a painting company before I started my real estate business. And, uh, and and it was it was good. That's why I did it when I started off in college. I had a painting company, and the transition, um, I just went all in. I like I like we're talking about. I got a coach. I started prospecting, and I didn't see a lot of success until I completely committed to prospecting. Um, and that's when I my business really took off. So I would just say get in a coaching coaching program, um, and learn as much as you can. Just YouTube videos, man. Just watch a lot of YouTube videos. That helps. Anything you guys want to add? I think it's your mindset. You got it. Who's that going again? Is that you, Brian? Nope. That's like echo. I don't know where it's coming from. So, so you need to have mindset. A lot of people think once I have this, then I'll do this, then I'll be this. So once I have ten deals, then I'll be able to go to work full time and then I'll be a full time agent and the reality is is you got to go believe that you're a full time agent go do full time agent and then you'll have full time agent so I think you just got to pop in and go I think if you're doing it a little bit at a time I think you're setting yourself up for failure it's either you're in or you're out it's just, there's no in between I agree yeah you just got to commit uh, I, the transition that I made was extremely quick. I, I basically um, completed the, the jobs I had. I had my crews finish them and shut the company down and got into real estate full time before I even had any business. Um, yeah. I mean, if I can add to that, I played basketball professionally before I got into real estate. Complete career change, but I just went all in. I didn't have any other source of income. Once I finished, I just said, okay, it's it's I make it or I make it. That's it. There's no other option. <laughs> And when you when you make that commitment, um, you'll 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 see the kind of fire you light under your ass, and you'll you'll get to work and you'll figure it out. Wait, wait, wait! Where did you play professional basketball at? Yeah. Uh, one year in South America and two years in Spain. What? Awesome. I had no clue. Where at in South America? Argentina. Argentina. Okay. Yeah, I love me some Argentina. <laughs> That's cool, Brian. I, I didn't know that about you, man. Oh, and to touch on the personal development, I tracked the numbers. I spent over twenty thousand dollars last year on personal development. Oh yeah, yeah. I've probably spent close to hundred fifty grand in the last five years. I'm sure. Yeah, easily over over the last five years, e easily over hundred grand for me. And, and it, I would never. I remember my first uh, education I I got into. Um, before I even got into real estate, was it was called the Financial Freedom Fast Track. I had no money. I put seventy five hundred dollars on two different credit cards to take it, and it was life changing. I didn't start making money very quickly from it, but it changed my mindset. And then the first real estate training program I got into was the nine week Fearless Agent program, which started into on demand coaching and. I was I sold two deals my first year in real estate. Once I got into that program, I took six listings in the first six weeks. So it's just changing 
your habits and your mindset and your actions. Sweet. That's it. Brian, when you door knock in the morning and no one answers, do you leave contact information? That's from Madison and Associates. Uh, basically, when I'm door knocking, if it is random doors, most of the time I just leave my business card. Unless I'm promoting another listing and I have a flyer of it, that's it. I just leave my business card. I mean, there, there's so many things you can leave, but I'm focusing more on the, the contacts that I actually make. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Uh, 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 let's see, Joe Warsack, I think that's how you say it. it. Have you ever considered hiring, or have you ever considered having someone else that is licensed in real estate to do your prospecting or cold calling for you, like an assistant? I, I think Colton just recently made a hire like that. Yeah, I think the key thing is to not do it for you, but to do enhance what you're currently doing. You've got to be the rainmaker. And and if you like I see a lot of people in talking about the concept of an ISA and they want to hire these virtual ISAs and they themselves don't even have the skill, what are the odds you're going to be able to train a, a someone in the Philippines or wherever these VAs are to really make that work? I think it's possible, but I think you yourself have to understand the core of what goes into prospecting and converting a lead. But yeah, I just hired uh, an agent that his whole job is to prospect, to set off the listing appointments and in-office buyer appointments. So I think it's a great idea when you're to that point. I don't think until you've hired a full-time assistant to do your transaction and your marketing, you should have probably two assistants before you start hiring people like that into your model. Yeah, that, that's the model. My, my goal is to eventually hire someone to prospect for me, but like Colton was saying, it, it's, I would say, a lot easier to hire that ISA, inside sales agent, when, when you know what you're doing so you can train them. And it takes, coming from a, a guy that I've, I mean, put over 7,000 contacts in on the phone last year, and, you know, I, I think I was just right around, I can't remember the total number of hours, but it takes a lot of work and energy and, and time to train that individual. And so if you're not already producing where you need to be, then it, it, you're going to actually go backwards by hiring that person too early. Yeah, I, I made that mistake with a buyer agent earlier uh, this year. I, I put a lot of time into training them, and it didn't work out, and uh, my prospecting suffered because of that. But now I have two rock star agents, I'm back on track, so you learn from those mistakes. So you got to have the systems in place to bring help on, whether it's an assistant, uh, whether it's a ISA, whether it's a buyer agent, you need to have those systems in place before you do it. You can't just yeah. hire them and expect them to know what the heck they're doing. It takes a lot of time, a lot more than I anticipated. Cool. Uh, any other questions you guys want to throw up there? We're, we're at the hour mark, so we'll wrap up here shortly. Cool. Well, that wraps up, guys. Um, good call. Appreciate it. Um, as always, you guys can find us on our YouTube channels. We're all posting videos there. Colton said he's going to post one a day, so there's some accountability for him to, to make sure he gets those up. Um, and, and my goal is to do the same, so I'll, I'll throw that out there for me too. Um, and, and the reason we do these YouTube, YouTube videos, guys, um, it, it's for you and, and it's for us too because when, when you teach what, what you're doing, uh, you only get better as well, so it keeps us motivated and we have a lot of fun with it too. Yeah. Also, tomorrow morning, guys, at, uh, well, I guess, noon Eastern Time, 11 Central, 10 o'clock Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific in Arizona time, I'm doing a an, an winning series interview with uh, James Michener out of Arizona. If you guys want to uh, listen to that, it's going to be a co cool interview. So that'll be tomorrow. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, guys. We'll catch you uh, next week. Bye, guys. See you guys. See ya.